All right, let's do it. Pro Team, September 8th, 2020. Make stay up for that whole lightning game last night. Looking good. They look hard to beat. They're the odds on favorite to win the whole thing. But uh, we've been down here before, haven't we? So let's hope this is it. All right. So, a few fun facts about proteins. The monomers are called amino acids. Remember that the monomers of a carbohydrate are monosaccharides. Uh, when we talk about lipids, the monomers of a triglyceride would be a glycerol with three fatty acids. A phospholipid would be a phosphate and two fatty acids. A monomer of a protein is called an amino acid. Now in nature, there are 20 amino acids, not more than 20, not about 20, not somewhere near 20, it's 20. And some of them are essential and some of them are not essential. It depends on the ones that your body can actually make or can't make. There are some amino acids that you have to get in your diet. In fact, I'm sure a lot of you have at least heard of the movie Jurassic Park. Well, in the movie, when the dinosaurs are breaking free, uh, Samuel L. Jackson in the movie says that when the dinosaurs were being genetically engineered, the head genetic engineer, um, he created an enzyme that made a faulty copy of the amino acid lysine. And so in order for the dinosaurs to get lysine, they had to be fed food with lysine. If the dinosaurs did not get lysine, then they would get into a coma and die. So in the event the dinosaurs somehow got off the island, uh, they would die because they weren't getting the amino acid that they normally would make. That's called an essential amino acid. An essential amino acid is an amino acid that you have to get in your diet because your body can't synthesize it. A non-essential amino acid are the ones that you naturally do make. The majority of the 20 amino acids that there are, are, are out in nature, your body cannot make. So you have to get them through your diet. So make sure that you're eating those, uh, you're eating all your veggies and cleaning your dinner plate. Now, some amino, uh, actually all the amino acids, that's a very weird name. So I'm never gonna ask you to memorize the names. That's not what you have to do, but I just want you to see how weird some of the names are, but don't worry, they're just words, it can't hurt you. So I'm just gonna write down a few of the 20, all right? So you have some there named valine, we abbreviate it V-A-L. You got lysine, like I just said, that's L-Y-S, leucine, L-E-U, and you know, those are easy. Then you got some nasty ones, tryptophan. I mean, that's a nightmare to spell. T-R-P, this one I hate. Uh, phenylalanine, something like that. P-H-E, let's see if I can do one more. Methionine. M-E-T. So that's just six of the total um, 120. And when you're making a protein, proteins have jobs, guys. Proteins do tasks. They actually get things done. They're structural proteins like the keratin in your hair, the keratin in your skin, the keratin on your arm. It may not seem like we have armor, like an armadillo or, or an alligator with very thick scales, but our skin is actually some semblance of protection. You may have heard that you have three layers of skin, your epidermis, your dermis, your subcutaneous. You actually have seven layers. And the very tip, tip, top layer is your keratinized layer, where it's a layer of dead skin and keratin, the same stuff that makes your nails and your hair. So if I take this little pen, I know it's not the sharpest thing in the world, but you can hear this. I'm not bleeding. But if you did that to my dermis, you know where tattoo ink is and where it's just below your epidermis, I would be bleeding. I would hurt myself because there's none of that protective keratin. Uh, it's the same stuff that makes up rhino horns. So <clears throat> keratin, elastin, and collagen, elastin and collagen, the two with ehlers danlos that hold us together, they're more the structural proteins. And then you have things like hemoglobin or, um, I can't think of the, uh, kinesins. They, they actually do things. They're called functional proteins. They're how we're able to survive every day. So I'm just gonna make something up. But um, hemoglobin, for example, is the protein in our blood 
that allows us to transport oxygen throughout our body. We all know that we inhale oxygen, it goes down to your bronchus, it goes into your lungs, and then into your little air sacs. And then right there in your air sac is where oxygen and your blood meet. And then the blood picks up the oxygen that you just breathed in and it circulates through your entire body. Well, it's holding, it, the oxygen is grabbing onto the hemoglobin molecule, or maybe it's the other way around. Hemoglobin grabs to the oxygen molecule. Now I'm just gonna make up the code. I don't have the code memorized, but we do know the code. I just don't have it remembered. So let's just pretend that the proper amino acid sequence for hemoglobin is this. Methionine, valine, glutamic acid, aspartine, blah, leucine. Let's just pretend that's it. If you put those amino acids in that code, you've got hemoglobin. What if you have a mutation where this happens? Here's your mutation. One little typo, one little wrong amino acid can cause your cells to go from looking like this, a nice round shape, to this. Anyone know what this disease is called where your blood cells turn into a crescent moon hook shape? This is called sickle cell anemia. It's a great example of human evolution. It's a great deterrent to malaria, not such a great deterrent to oxygenation. This actually can lead to blood clots. It can lead to hypoxia, which means you don't get enough oxygen to survive. Um, this is just an example of one little ticky-tacky mutation to a protein causing the entire protein to behave incorrectly. And when blood cells are like that, they really, really are not good at carrying O2. And that can cause trouble for the person. And that originated in Southeast Africa um, where malaria is a huge problem. It's a disease spread by mosquitoes. When you have sickle cell anemia, it's tough to get malaria. That's good. But when you have sickle cell anemia, it's tough to carry oxygen throughout your body, which is bad. All right, let's move on. Um, let's talk about the structure of a protein. Or, excuse me, um, structure of amino acid. Now, amino acids, as I've already said many times, there's 20 different types. And if you ever want to build up muscle, you want to build up body mass, and you want to get like the good weight, you want to have a lot of protein in your diet. But that's only if you're really working out. Because when you work out, you, you damage your muscles. You're basically shredding your muscles. And they have to heal. And the, the more you work out, the faster your muscles heal. It's just, that's, that's nature. They're adapting to your lifestyle. That's why they say if you really want to shake up your workout you really want to shake up your workout because you have muscle memory your muscles get used to your your routine so you want to do things different but um whenever people typically finish a workout they'll have a protein shake and in a protein shake you generally have the amino acids so you don't have to digest a big giant polypeptide into a peptide and then from a peptide to an amino acid you want to get the amino acid already in your body so your muscles can take it in and heal themselves and make themselves even bigger and stronger than they were before. It's kind of like when you break a bone, your bone heals back stronger than it was before because you have brand new bone cells. Well, it sort of works that way with muscles. You, you help your muscles heal with amino acids and they get bigger and stronger than they were before. So with amino acids, you start off with the elements right in the middle. This, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw the molecular structure of it what element do you suppose is in the middle of an amino acid? I'll give you a hint, organic. Carbon is in the dead center. And how many bonds can carbon hold? One, two, three, four. Very good. So just as you may expect, carbon is at the core of every macromolecule. In a little bit, I'll go over what elements make up an amino acid. On top of um, the carbon, you have a hydrogen, that really is of no significance. That doesn't really do much. But on the left over here, I'm gonna draw something that we call an amine group. Oops. Make sure this is sure.
This is called NH2. That's the chemical formula. The name is called an amine group. You don't necessarily have to say the word group. Amine is just fine. That is called NH2. And on the other side of the carbon, you have another carbon bonded to an oxygen, bonded to another oxygen, and then to a hydrogen. And that is a double bond up there on the top. Now, before I go and name this entire molecule, this is called COOH. But before I go and name this, can anybody tell me what is this right here? Just OH by itself? What do you call OH? That's hydroxide right there. That's going to come in later. This whole thing, however, guys, the COOH is called carboxylic acid. And if you get the words amine with acid, why not change the amine to amino, amino acid? And that's how they get their name. But that is not the end of the story. Because on that bottom bond on the carbon is probably the most important part. This is called the R group. There are various R groups that attach to the common structure of an amino acid. that gives each amino acid its unique qualities. I, I know that not everybody here plays video games, but you have at least heard of them. You have heard of an Xbox. You have heard of a PlayStation. You have heard of a Nintendo. I want you to think of this entire structure here that I just highlighted in blue. I can erase that. I want you to think that whole part. That's the Xbox. I get Halo. Xbox stays the same. I get Mortal Kombat. Xbox stays the same. I get Grand Theft Auto. The Xbox stays the same. It's the R group. That's the video game. The R group is the game. You can plug in different R groups and you can get very different outcomes. But no matter what game you use, you're still putting them into the same console. Yeah, one second. So this whole part here. That's your Xbox. That's what all amino acids have in common. But that R group is what makes every amino acid different. It could be a large uh, functional group. It could be a small functional group, but it gives them all a different characteristic and different quality. And there's 20 different types. You can get valine, you can get tryptophan, you can get leucine, lysine, phenylalanine, all the different types. Now, let's say, I'm going to try to draw another amino acid real fast. Uh, okay, so I just drew another amino acid. What if I want to get a protein chain going, an amino acid chain, same thing. Do you remember by what process two monomers can bond together to form a larger molecule? That's from last week. How do you do that? Right? That dehydration what? Dehydration synthesis. Well, in dehydration synthesis, you take out water. But I don't see H2O here, but what two ions make H2O? Go ahead. 
hydroxide, which is OH, and a hydrogen, which is H. Well, look at what we have here. There's a hydrogen or a hydroxide right there. There's a hydrogen right here. If I erase those two, you will now have what we call a peptide bond. And two separate amino acids have now bonded together to begin forming a peptide chain. And it only gets bigger from there. If I wanted to break those two apart, what do you do? What if I just ate a steak at Burns and I'm digesting all that protein? I want to get the individual amino acids. What do you do? How do you break two, how do you break a larger molecule apart into its smaller units? By what process is that, Hannah? That is called hydrolysis. You, re, you reintroduce the hydroxide, you reintroduce the hydrogen, and that bond between the two molecules breaks off. Okay. Are there any questions so far? Okay, while that's being written, I want to go over the elements that compose a protein. So I should have done that after that. Just based on looking on the amino acid, what elements do you see? Come on. What elements do you see in the amino acid? Okay. See nitrogen. What else? Carbon. What else? Oxygen. What else? Hydrogen. Good. And guys, sometimes you'll see a fifth, and that would be sulfur. But carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen are the main four. Sometimes you'll see sulfur. Not all the time. Sometimes. This was a question on the AP exam uh, not too long ago. They say, you find a mystery molecule on a planet way off in space. You bring it back to your lab and you find that this biomolecule has sulfur. Oh my gosh. What molecule is it? Your choices would be carb, lipid, protein, or nucleic acid. The answer would be protein because it contains sulfur. So, uh, proteins are the only macromolecule that has sulfur in them. Fun fact. All right, now let's uh, talk about some other functions of proteins, okay? Then we'll get into the structure of protein. That'll be about it. <clears throat> so let's talk about the protein hierarchy. Okay, well, first off, you, you begin with the amino acids. When you have a chain of amino acids, you form a peptide. When you have multiple peptides, you form a polypeptide. And when you have, when you have a three-dimensional polypeptide that's in its proper shape, you have a protein. When I say bent into its proper shape, every protein is designed to be in a, in a specific orientation to do a specific job. When I go to open up this, this cabinet, my hand needs to be positioned just like this to open it up. Well, let's say that my hand is this. That didn't work. 
How about this? How about this? What about this? You have to have it just right. And that's exactly how proteins work. If the proteins are not shaped just right, they're not going to work. The key and the lock have to match. If they don't lock, if they don't fit, the proteins are not going to work properly. An example of that would be sickle cell anemia. <clears throat> Okay, let's go over uh, a few jobs of protein. Okay, they're involved in metabolism, which is just a series of chemical reactions. When we get to, I think, unit three, you're going to hear the word enzyme a lot. Enzymes carry out chemical reactions because they are biological catalysts. They basically are able to accelerate the rate of a reaction without being used up. And a word that you're going to hear a lot again is enzyme. Enzymes are proteins. They're made by your DNA and RNA. Your, the, your saliva in your mouth is an enzyme. Adren no, not adrenaline. That's a hormone. Um, Let's see, pepsin in your stomach breaks down protein. That's an enzyme. They're just catalysts. They speed up a reaction. Number two, we have supports. This is what people at Ehlers-Danlos know all too much about. It's basically uh, the fibers that support you. Your collagen, your elastin, your keratin. You may have heard of collagen injections. People get those in their lips, try to make them look more puffy or poutier. You guys are young, you're teenagers. Your, your collagen and elastin naturally would be fine. If you pull back on your skin, it goes right back to the way it was. But as you get older and older and older, your DNA gets older with you and your DNA makes your proteins and those get older. So, when you pull on grandma's arm, it doesn't necessarily go back to its hug in your body, it just kind of droops. Because the older you get, the weaker your collagen and elastin gets. So your skin is much more stretchy and it doesn't hug your body as well as, when, as it did when you were younger. Fun fact, drugs, alcohol, and excessive exposure to UV radiation ages your skin. So you could be 25 years old now the skin of like a 45 year old. So watch out how much uh, UV radiation you expose yourself to. And I hope you don't partake in smoking or drinking, but that also ages you too. Number three is transports. I already talked about hemoglobin. Transports oxygen throughout your body. Number four. Um, hold on a sec. Okay. Number four is going to be defense. You know, there's a lot of talk about a coronavirus vaccine and coronavirus antibodies. Let me tell you what an antibody is real fast. Your body has an immune system and your body naturally has a way to fight uh, infection whether it be a viral or bacterial or parasitic or fungal infection. Well, in this case, coronavirus is a, it's a virus and it has these little markers on the surface of it called an antigen. When your immune system is exposed to an antigen, it tries to learn what it is so it can fight it. And your body will develop these proteins called antibodies, which help to fight against uh, an infection. If any of you were to get a coronavirus antibody test, what they're testing for is to see if you're bloodstream actually has antibodies. And generally, the only way that you develop antibodies for a particular infection is you actually had the infection. So if I test you and you tested negative for antibodies, that would likely mean you haven't had the disease yet. But if I got tested and I tested positive for antibodies, that means that somewhere in the recent past, I had COVID 
and I survived. And now I have a natural defense for it. When I was four years old, I had chicken pox and I survived. I didn't die. It's not deadly, but I survived. I want to sound, make it sound too dramatic. If you took a blood sample from me now, I'm 34, I would have antibodies from when I was four. When you get a vaccine, that's, that is giving your body the, the tools to make an antibody to a virus without getting the virus. A lot of girls and guys now get the Gardasil shot. Um, you know, heaven forbid that you have unprotected sex, whether it be um, uh, by your consent or not to your consent, and you contracted HPV, which is the human papillomavirus, and some of them can cause cancer in the cervix of a female's reproductive system. The Gardasil shot provides you with um, the codes, so to speak, they're called antigens, to teach your immune system how to make the antibodies. So in real life, when you are exposed to the real virus, your immune system goes, I know what this is. We're not getting sick. I can kill it right now. That's what vaccines do. And that's why there's such a rush to get a vaccine for COVID. So people can get the shot rather than get sick. They just are fine. And vaccines are not 100% foolproof. It's like wearing a seatbelt. certainly improves your odds. Uh, we got regulation. This is just done by hormones. On Friday, we talked about testosterone and um, steroids. Those are lipid-based hormones, but there's also protein-based hormones. And finally, number six is going to be motion. Your muscles. Protein, protein, protein. Okay. We have one last part to get to, and that's going to be on the shapes of protein, and that should wrap this up. There are four shapes. One, it's called your primary structure. Primary means one or first. This is just a, uh, a sequence of amino acids. It kind of looks like a broken Gasparilla necklace. It's just amino acid linked to another amino acid, to another amino acid, to another amino acid, to another, to another, to another, to another, to another. It just goes on and on and on. It could be hundreds or even thousands of amino acids long. Remember, there are 20 different amino acids. You can get a lot of different combinations. It's just like the letters of the alphabet. If I were to take the word D, O, G, you have a domesticated animal that descends from wolves. If you get, you take those same letters, you arrange it, G, O, D, you get like a, a deity from whatever religion to that a lot of people might worship as part of the faith-based uh, culture. Those are the same letters, but just like with your amino acids, you get them in different orientations, different sequences, you get totally different amino or proteins, totally different outcomes. Number two, secondary structure. This is where bonding of amino acids Uh, leads to two types of structures. The first one looks like this. It's like a, a squiggle. This is called an alpha helix. It's just basically a, a primary structure, guys, but now it's starting to bond and get longer and starting to take shape. Remember, shape matters when it comes to protein. And the Greek letter alpha kind of looks like a fish. That's the Greek letter alpha. The other one is called, it's like a zigzag. And this is called a beta pleated sheet. And the symbol for beta is that. It looks like a B with a stem or a handle.
this might be something that you would see on one of my tests or the Hillsborough County first semester exam or the AP exam. Which of the following structures has an alpha helix? Primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, quaternary structure, secondary. The proteins are starting to take shape and they're different shapes depending on the, the bonding between amino acids. Okay, number three, tertiary. Tertiary means third, if you've never heard that word before. We don't say thirdly, we say tertiary. <clears throat> this is the three-dimensional or 3D final folding Uh, this allows the polypeptide to perform its task. This protein or this peptide, it has to be able to bend and twist into a proper way to do whatever job it is to do, whether it be to carry oxygen through your bloodstream, whether it be to break down carbohydrates in your mouth. It has to be in the proper shape. And if it's mutated, it's not gonna be able to do what it's supposed to do. And then the last one, everyone, is called the quaternary structure. This is just going to be multiple folded polypeptides that join together to form a protein. And not all proteins have the quaternary structure. All right. What elements are found in the protein? Who can tell me? Anna? Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. You said oxygen? Okay. Yep. Five out of the six from Schnapps are found in the protein. All right. And that is it.